examples. It exposes the uh, reason for that. Well, it's, it's a matter of preservation. Teeth are very dense. And I think I, I, I think anybody who's, who's uh, dug a site where bone preservation is reasonable is used to the, the idea of finding, in most circumstances, more teeth than anything else. And that's uh, largely a preservation thing. They, one of the reasons, I mean, this, this business that where Dart argued, Raymond Dart argued, that you have these disproportions in body parts and in, in skeletal elements, and some skeletal elements, like the, the uh, end of the, of the arm, was much more common than others. He didn't realize, he didn't think, if, he, if he'd given it some thought, he would have realized that some bones are just much denser than others, preserve better. I mean, once bones are in the ground, or even before, they're subjected to all kinds of destructive pressures. An animal or a person will, an animal might chew on them. People can do quite a lot of damage with their teeth, too. This has been observed many times. Or people might slice at them with a stone tool or whatever. And that causes uh, destruction. Additionally, if they're lying on the ground, they can be leached out by ground acids, or they can be ground against one another, whatever. Some, some body parts tend to, pretend to survive better than others, simply because they're more durable. And teeth are among the most durable of all. Yeah? Well, uh, it, it may be that I, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a flabby idea, actually. Maybe that's part of the problem. And a lot of people don't like it as an idea. But basically, this is a site which is roughly, there are two sites, actually. I only mentioned one of them, but I have at least two where I can show exactly the same thing. Where in the period of time between 130,000, let's say 70 or 60,000 years ago, in the faunas that come from these sites, eland are very, very common, and wild pigs, the two kinds that, that could occur there, the bush pig and the warthog, are very uncommon. Now, when you get into younger sites, sites that are younger than this, certainly younger than 40,000, it's the reverse. Pig remains are very common and eland are very uncommon. And that, the younger sites are, are somehow a better reflection of what I would expect the environment to be like. Because I can't think of a modern African fauna where eland are the most common animal by any means. Eland are, are never that common. I mean, not, not that there are areas. I mean, you can on the Serengeti, there may be several, uh, several hundred, perhaps as many as, as, as well, there have been estimates as many as 15,000. 15, but that doesn't compare to the number of wildebeest that or to the number of warhawks for that matter. There's not a, I can't think of a modern African environment where even would be that common and pigs would be that uncommon. So there's something very strange about the way in which these people before 60,000 years ago were hunting the animals that occurred around their sites. And I think that what's involved here is that they were technologically rather unsophisticated. It's hard to be more precise. As I say, maybe they, in order to kill an animal, they had to walk right up to it. And if you had to do that, I think you'd be more inclined to deal with the less dangerous animals. But it, it, there's a problem with it. I, I would hesitate, but it's just a very interesting contrast. Yeah? Do uh, you know how far back the use of fire goes? It's hard to say, actually. In our sites, <coughs> the oldest well documented use of fire in this part of the world is about 130,000 years. That Clossies River Mouth site, that we were looking at, the Clossies site, in the deposits, and I'm sorry, I couldn't brought a profile, I'm showing you very clearly. You get nice lenses of ash and charcoal, which unquestionably represent fossil fireplaces. Sometimes they're surrounded by rocks. Those things can be documented back to 130,000 years. Prior to that time, it becomes a bit of a problem. There's a site located very near Makapanskop, for example, in the same valley called the Cave of Hogs. It's an older site than Fossies, no question. That people were making hand axes, much older, perhaps as much as a half a million years. Cave of Hogs sounds like a place where there should be hogs. <coughs> well, what the black stuff turns out to be uh, uh, backwater and not fire. And that doesn't mean to say that people weren't making fires there, but there's no clear evidence for it. There's a site uh, near, near Cape Town, again a cave site with hand axes in it, again much older than Quasi, perhaps as much as a half a million years, where when you look at the deposits, you don't see clear cars, but there's a lot of ash in the deposit nonetheless. Now, whether this is a fire in the, you know, perhaps the stuff all being mixed up, or whether they, the people may have been bringing in vegetable material that got accidentally lit, you know, it might be an accidental fire rather than a hearth of some sort. It's a very difficult thing to sort out. Clear cut hearths, though, which were undoubtedly used for cooking, perhaps for heat, only go back about 130,000 years in this part of the world. I suppose the oldest ones I can think of in the overall archaeological record would be Jokodian in, in China, with dates of a half, half a million years or more. There they have clear cut. Again, these ashes of lemon and charcoal in association with Peking man, and with a date of at least a half a million years. And there's no clear evidence for that kind of antiquity in Africa. Yeah? Um, about those reconstructions you showed just at the beginning, those paintings. Mm -hmm. When you made those, how much of that was based on some solid evidence, and how much of it was just um, guessing? Well, 
Mostly, yes. <laughs> the, the, what you do is, uh, you see, in a site like this, in addition to having the animal remains, I'm, I'm interested in the animal remains, but we also have uh, plant fossils. So we know something about the plants here. We, we have both, we, there's an area of the deposit which is a, a kind of fossil peat, and it actually has bits of wood in it and other <coughs> macro plant remains. There's also pollen. The pollen hasn't been studied in as much detail as it'd like to be. There's a problem because the, the local plants, the pollen they produce is well known. And you have to know, I mean, obviously, before you can identify fossil pollen, you have to know what the reason pollen looks like. Okay, but the plant remains suggest a kind of open, grassy plain with trees scattered on it. And the animals seem to conform with that. You can tell, I mean, the, these animals are not that old that many of them are extinct, but they have close living relatives. And you can tell from their close living relatives what their environmental preferences would have been. So I think the overall reconstruction is OK. And we know the, the sea was right there. It's about 10 miles away now. But in addition to those seal bones, seal and penguin bones, there are also a few whale bones and things like that. So we're, what we're dealing with is a, a river entering the sea right near the site. And along the floodplain of the river were terrestrial animals, antelopes, pigs, and things like that. The, the details of reconstruction are pretty difficult. And the, the <coughs> putting the flesh back on the animals isn't so easy either. Yeah? How reliable do you think their absolute base are for fossil on the surface? Well, OK, that's a very good question. The one site in particular, the Elensfontein site from which the Saldana skull came, that's a, a particularly crucial site for dealing with this problem. The human skull from the site, which I said, in my opinion, looks like Peking Man or Java Man, Homo erectus type of skull, did come off the surface. And so do all the other, virtually all the other fossils we have. But the fossils as a group, compared to things that you find in an olivai gorge in, say, bed two, upper bed two, bed three. Well, mostly upper, bed three and bed four are not very, very well known at olivai. They're not very fossiliferous. But in upper bed two, we have some nice sites. And the fossils are just like that. Well, how old are those fossils at olivai gorge? Well, ask Mary Lakey. She does a million years. OK, well, let's say this site's a little bit younger than that. But I mean, I think even though they come off the surface, you can tell by the, the kinds of animals that are represented. And then you assume that the human skull somehow belongs with those animals that the things are quite old. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. But whether we're talking about 400,000 or 900,000, I don't know. And I don't know any way to get at that. It's a good point. Yeah? What size of popul population for humans would you consider um, to affect such a drastic change in the animal life? Well, that's a good point, too. And in fact, some people, when I've suggested this idea before, people say, well, you know, we're even art. Let's suppose that you get people showing up at Langevin Beck two million years ago and make the first appearance. Would they really have been that numerous, that important as meat eaters that they would have caused these other things to become extinct? And I, I mean, I can't say. It wouldn't have been very many. And it is a more complicated problem than I presented it, because some of the things that became that, that became less numerous. Let's, let's, I talked about cats. I talked about hyenas. Well, the cats were largely things with long, dagger-like canine teeth, things we call saber tooths, and there were some things called false saber tooths as well, but all with the same kind of dental structure. Now, they're animals which obviously they're killing <coughs> large ungulates, but they're not cracking up the bones. And you, an animal like that starts to, to crack down on big bones and it breaks off its saber teeth. And that means that they left a lot more for hyenas than the living lion or leopard does. So that all you have to do in order to eliminate some of those hyenas is eliminate the saber toothed cats, bring in modern cats. And at Lanaban Beck, there's no, there, there is nothing like the modern lion or the, or the modern leopard. So part of what probably happened to the carnivores that lived at Lanaban Beck 45 million years ago was the arrival of other kinds of carnivores, too, which caused some which were perhaps better at killing the, the local animals than the ones that were already there were. And then once they're present, say the, new, the, the, the modern lion maybe shoves out one or two saber-toothed cats, then that has an effect on the hyenas as well. They become less numerous. Because the lion can eat a lot more of what a hyena can eat than could those saber-toothed cats. A lion leaves a lot less for hyenas than those saber-toothed cats almost certainly did. So it's a more complicated problem. Still, I mean, the, the, it strikes I, I can't help but feel that humans I mean, surely they must have had an impact when they entered this meat-eating way of life. And maybe that's part of it, too. I think what we really need is more information, more detailed data. East Africa would be the place to get it. Because one problem we have in this part of the world is the record isn't as continuous. You have to skip from site to site. We've got long time intervals. We have this site at Langevin Beck at four to five million years. Then the next thing we have is up, up 2,000 miles away in Transvaal, a million years or two million years later. In East Africa, they have continuous sequences. Same place, right straight through. And if they collected this stuff right, I think they could answer questions like this. One, one problem that we've had for a long time, a lot of past with a lot of people, you get these sites in East Africa, in Olduvai Gorge. You've got sites in Bedouin Olduvai Gorge, 1.8 million years old. Here are a bunch of animal bones and stone tools scattered out there in the excavation. Here are some bones of, the, of Australopithecine, or sometimes a more advanced time. 
Who's responsible for the stone tools? Who's responsible for the animals? Was anybody eating animals? Or were these things just sort of <coughs> perhaps brought to the site, well, maybe scavenged or something like this, with their active hunting going on? To what extent does an association between stone tools and animal bones mean that people were major meat eaters, or really eating meat in a major way? Or to what extent is this sort of chance, a chance occurrence that happened like baboons would kill monkeys or small antelope and eat them. If baboons were to concentrate the bones, you might get a sight. Maybe that's all people were doing. It's more or less a, a, a random sort of occurrence. They're not really eating meat in any major way at all, a little by Gordon 1.8 million years ago. Well, I don't think you're ever going to get an answer to a question like that by looking at a single site. I mean, you're not going to get somebody lying on the ground with a stone tool about to bash an animal. The way to get the answer to a question like that is to look at the overall picture, hopefully, by looking at the frequencies of different kinds of animals through time. And I think you'll find that at some point, well, we know this happened in some general sense, when people became meat eaters in a major way, carnivores, the, their major competitors, must have declined because people were enormously successful. It goes on today. And we should be able to pick this up in the paleological record. Maybe I'm being a little overly optimistic as long as I'm back, but I think it should be there. Some yeah? When, when you say that humans were meat eaters in a major way, what percentage of the diet would you say was meat? Yeah. Well, gee, I mean, I, I think about the only way to get an answer to that question would be to look at modern hunter-gatherers in, in the same kind of environment. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I tried to do this. Uh, there's enormous variability. Of course, in the Kalahari, you see, where, where, the, where, where the nearest parallels are, the sort of central desert of southern Africa, uh, there isn't all that much meat to eat. And there, you might you have people who, who you know, 10, 15 percent of, of their diet by weight. Is, you know, that's the maximum in many cases for meat. But that's a kind of meatless area. Uh, I, what would hunter-gatherers who lived on the Serengeti? And we don't really have decent observations on hunter-gatherers in the Serengeti, because by the time ethnographers got in there, the people who were occupying the Serengeti were not hunter-gatherers to any great extent. They were largely cattle herders. What, what would a hunter-gatherer, though, exposed to the vast animal concentrations of the Serengeti, or for that matter, the Eastern Cape province of South Africa, the time of historic contact, how much would they have taken? 50%? I just don't know. I think it's a hard thing. And so the ethnographic parallels, all the ethnographic hunter-gatherers we have, and it's from them that we would get a, an idea of this, are living in marginal environments where they've been pushed by more advanced peoples. They're not living in the best possible environments for hunter-gatherers, even in this part of Africa. But it may, let's say 50% maximum. Where did you get that 50%? Just, just uh, right under my head. <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't mean to be facetious, but I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to guess. I, I, can't, I wish we had a, a single example of hunter-gatherers in Africa dealing with, with the best sort of hunter-gatherer environment that Africa has to offer, like, say, the Serengeti or someplace where there really are a lot of animals on the hoof per square mile. You know, a place like the Kalahari, you know, sort of an animal here and another one 10 miles away. You see these pictures on, you know, these, these poor people trying to catch a giraffe. I mean, they've got to look for one for, for a week before they even see one. So you, how can, you know, you can't, you can't use them. They're not good ethnographic parallels for the archaeological record. That would be my feeling. And therefore, it's very difficult to generalize from them. What's more, of course, they don't make stone tools. But, I mean, there are all kinds of other problems. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to treat your, your question flippantly at all. I, I, I just don't know. I'm just guessing it could be as much as that. Of course, we have ethnographic examples among the peoples of the North where it gets near to 100%. Uh, obviously, that's not a good parallel either. Yeah. Did you find anything similar to uh, <coughs> what Dart describes, these uh, bones jammed one into Oh, I should have said something about that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, that's a very good point. I, I left out a couple of important points. Yes. The bones jammed into bones. Well, I've been working at a Miocene site. Uh, that's a site that's probably about 15 million years old in Southwest Africa and Namibia, where we got these bones jammed in all kinds of bones, just like that. And there's no question that people weren't, I mean, people were 10 million years away, not just distance, but years. So that kind of thing happens. And it's true at Lama Vec, too. We have lots of bones. Happen? I think it's just moving into deposit. And in fact, Dark, I mean, it's not very many bones about the Pascot that are like that. He selected those out. It's like, uh, you know, you can always find, in any kind of, of natural gravel deposit, you can always find a few pieces if you look hard enough that look like artifacts. And I think it's the same kind of thing. I think he, he was selecting from a very large sample and found something like that. And every large bone sample I've ever looked at that I think is natural has a few things like that. As far as the bashing is concerned, well, it's now been shown that that's almost certainly all post-mortem. It happens in the ground. It's crushing of the deposit. And uh, Bob Brain at the Toronto Museum has done it fairly conclusively. In fact, the bashing is quite incredible. The dart was right. These people weren't just hitting each other on the head with clubs. I mean, they would stand over the... the the one that they just they kept keep pounding and pounding and pounding, so the skull would go like that. I mean, they were they were really inflicting enormous amounts of damage, and it's much more plausible that this was done after death. And you can actually see in some cases when you look at the rock that was attached to the skull, you can see a a, a bit of a pebble or something that was in fact pressing on the skull, causing the depressed fracture or something like this, 
rather than a cause. But that's no, that's, those are important points. I don't know. I mean, I can't explain that kind of thing in the, the, the juxtaposition of one bone into another, except to say that I've seen it in lots of contexts where I don't think people are involved. And in contexts where I don't think they could have been involved. It's about the only answer I have. Yeah? How old did you say that Elon's five to you decided? Well, I would say roughly half a million years. That's an important point. You know, there was a book about um, 1962, I think, called The Origin of Races by a man by the name of Carlton Kuhn. And this skull figured very prominently in that book. The, I didn't show you a picture, but I'm sorry. I, I should have been more thoughtful and brought some pictures of, of fossils, because I know they're interesting, too. I, I tend to be more interested in the animal bones than the human bones. But anyway, this human skull from Elon's Fontaine figured very prominently in this book, because everybody knew, said Carlton Kuhn, that that skull was only 40,000 years old. And you can still find that in a lot of books. And since it looked very archaic, very primitive, didn't look like Homo sapiens to him, looked like Homo erectus, he said that was proof that Homo erectus only evolved into Homo sapiens in Africa 40,000 years ago. Whereas in Europe, it seems to have happened 250,000 years ago. Now we know, he said, why Africans didn't invent the wheel and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, and this is in the book. I'm not being facetious. You can read it in the preface. Well, it now turns out, I mean, beyond all the other arguments you can bring to bear on that kind of thing, it now turns out that that skull is at least, I'm convinced, in terms of the animals that are represented, at least half a million years old. This Clossy's River, how do you, I can go into that in a little more detail, this Clossy's River mouse stuff that I was talking about. We know it goes back to 130,000 years. I have excellent evidence for that. Without getting into the evidence, let me tell you about the animals. The animals from that site are completely modern. It's the modern fauna of Africa, with the exception of the few extinct things, things that became extinct at 10,000 years ago. At Clossy's River mouth, there are no saber-toothed cats. There are no short-necked antler giraffes. There are no giant baboons. There were baboons in Africa once, as big as gorillas, very common over the Black Gorge, very common at Elon's Fontaine, as are saber-toothed cats, as are uh, antler giraffes, and a whole variety of other things. Now, uh, these things clearly were extinct by 130,000 years ago. I think they were extinct long before that. And if the skull, from, as I'm sure it is, at Elon's Fontaine belongs with them, then the skull is much older than 130,000 years. I would say half a million. Now, there, there, there is a technique for getting dates that you may have heard about on these things called amino acid racemization. We actually take a, a bit of bone, and by studying the, the amino acids in it, uh, they, it's the isomers. You, they, you take an amino acid when it, after the death of an animal, it does a kind of, I don't understand this kind of thing very well, and I hope I don't distort it too much, but it does a kind of chemical, or actually kind of photo uh, uh, flip-flop, a mirror, it becomes a mirror image of itself, so the, the amino acid leucine becomes isoleucine. And this happens at a rate which is theoretically calculatable. Unfortunately, it's dependent upon the rate, it's dependent upon temperature, it's also dependent upon pH. So there are a lot of problems with this technique. Anyway, you can theoretically take a bit of bone, and if it has a little bit of the original protein in it, you can use this technique to try and get an age on the bone by looking at the amount of leucine, say, versus isoleucine, and one amino acid versus its mirror image. And if you think you know the rate at which the mirror image is forming from the original amino acid, all right, you can guess the age of the bone. Uh, this has been done for you on Spontane. Admittedly, I told the investigator what I thought the age was, it comes out about 300,000 years. You know, it's nice. I mean, I, maybe if I'd said 50,000, it would have come out 50,000 too. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of problematic technique, because obviously it's not like radiocarbon. The rate at which radiocarbon decays is not dependent upon temperature, the temperature in which it's decaying, or the, you know, anything like that. But this bone dating thing is. So I wouldn't take it all that seriously. It seems to confirm my ideas. <laughs> Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Klein. I think uh, that <clears throat> I was tempted to say this at the beginning, and I'm glad that I didn't now, but I think that uh, you may appreciate that uh, although when one thinks of early man in Africa, one's mind automatically focuses on East Africa, there is in fact a lot 